Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. What is the one most important factor in attaining and maintaining sobriety? That factor, again, in my opinion, is honesty. For honesty is the difference between sobriety and slipping. It is the difference between happiness and unhappiness. It is the difference between sanctity and sin. And after 14 years of experience with thousands upon thousands of members of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am convinced that we could actually reduce the whole program to that one word, honesty. For this reason, the only prayer that is used at the retreats that I give is the following. O oh God, grant us the grace to see ourselves as you see us, that knowing ourselves in thy will, we shall be enabled to carry it out in our daily lives. In other words, asking simply for the grace to be honest. Now we should have realized this many years ago. Remember in school, we were told honesty is the best policy, <laughs> but we didn't believe it, did we? First, there was the little white lies, and then some more bigger white lies, and then into the black lies to get out of the white lies. And then more black lies to get out of the lies we told, to get out of the lies we told, to get out of the lies we told. So that the alcoholic, at the end of his drinking career, ended up a pathological liar. First of all, he deceived himself. That's the reason any intimation that he might be alcoholic was always met with, me alcoholic? Oh, oh yeah, I take a couple beers once in a while, but not an alcoholic. We tried to deceive others, and we did for a while. We had to. We couldn't otherwise justify our existence. And so we put on a false front. And we became past masters at excuse making. Until finally we didn't deceive them anymore. And we ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. In our spiritual life we even attempted to deceive God. How did we pray? Oh God get me off this bins and I'll never take another drink as long as I live big liars <laughs> we weren't asking for sobriety we were asking for uh, God to keep us from being hurt anymore and as a result we had confusion of mind suffering untold and failure about uh, two years ago Speaking of the alcoholic being such a liar, I was on the panel, the Midwest panel of psychiatrists in their convention, believe it or not. <laughs> and I was to give the closing talk on Sunday afternoon. And I had to be there for the other two days and I listened to their talks. Didn't understand them, but I listened to them. And uh, it was amazing how many of these good men came to me and said, Father, you know, the trouble is with the alcoholic, we catch them lying so much. I said, well, you should be surprised if you catch them telling the truth. <laughs> now, when does this pathological liar, the alcoholic, begin to be honest? when he recognizes the fact that he is a pathological liar. Now, if honesty is so important, let's see 
what it really means. What is honesty? Well, honesty comes from the Latin word honestas. That means oneness. Therefore, if I am at one, or if there is a oneness between me and all the circumstances of my life, I am honest with God, with my neighbor, my family, myself, and all the inanimate circumstances um, in which I live. Or in other words, when my convictions agree with my acceptances, then I am honest. For example, the alcoholic, we had the conviction inside that we were alcoholic long before we came to AA. But we didn't accept that because we were not honest. Therefore, when we accept the fact whatever it may be, of every circumstance in my life, then we are honest. Honesty is the best policy. Now history is loaded with examples of the dramatic difference between honesty and dishonesty. Between the successful man who was honest and the failure who was dishonest. Now let's take a few of, of these examples. First there was St. Paul. His name originally was Saul, you know. And he was a Roman. And it tells us that he hated Christians. In fact, it says that when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the Christians, that he was going, breathing vengeance upon Christianity. He hated Christians, but his hatred was honest. He wasn't going to Damascus because Caesar had sent him or to please his wife. He wasn't married or his sister, if he had one, or his friends, or he wasn't going to Damascus to have a good time over the weekend. He was going there because he hated Christians and he wanted to persecute them. And even in that hatred, he was honest. Now look what happened. As he was going along the road, there was a bolt of lightning struck him off his horse. And as he lay there on the ground, he heard a voice. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now notice his answer. Immediately Saul said, Lord, who is it I persecute? There we had grace and honesty meeting head on. And when that happens, something's got to give. And it isn't the grace of God. Paul was honest. Now what would the dishonest person have said? I wonder what we would have said had we been Paul's place there on the ground. And we heard someone say, uh, why persecutest thou me? I think we would say, what do you mean? Who's persecuting anybody? <laughs> I'm not persecuting anybody. I was just going down to Damascus to have a good time. But Paul was honest. And he ended up as the great apostle to the Gentiles because he was honest. He wasn't chosen because he was honest. God chooses whomsoever he wishes. But having been chosen and with honesty plus grace, he became the great St. Paul. Honesty is the best policy. Then there was Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He was uneducated. But Peter was honest. Now look how this gives evidence of itself when he went to the courtyard. Why did he go to the courtyard? Why did he follow Christ? Because he loved Christ. He wanted to be near Christ. He was a coward, but he was honest. And so when Christ left the court and came out through the yard and glanced at Peter, once again, grace and honesty met head on. And as it tells us, Peter went out and wept lovingly. And Peter became the leader of the apostles because he was honest. 
Honesty is the best policy. And then there was Mary Magdalene. Remember Mary Magdalene? She was a prostitute. There's no use trying to cover it up. That's what she was, a prostitute. Now, many of you know that all of my talks are originally given as retreat talks. So when I gave this talk for the first time about three years ago, naturally I was not too acquainted with the talk at the time. And as I came to this point without thinking, I said, now I have had a lot of experience with prostitutes. <laughs> women's retreats. <laughs> what I had meant to say <laughs> was that since I had been in AA and had given the retreats over the years, that many women had come to me who had been prostitutes. And I found out that there are two distinct types of prostitutes. There are first the ones who are such because of the financial gain. That is the bulk of the prostitutes. But there are another kind. They are prostitutes because they want to be prostitutes. <laughs> Magdalene was that kind. It tells us that Magdalene loved the company of men. So she was an honest prostitute. And so once again, when she came in to the Pharisee's home and shed the tears of repentance, and with her tears washed the feet of Christ and dried them with her hair, once again, grace and honesty met head on. And Magdalene was told by Christ, much is forgiven because she had loved much. That same passion, that same drive, once turned toward God, led her to the heights of sanctity, to such an extent that it was to her, even before the apostles, that Christ appeared after the resurrection. Honesty is the best policy. Then there was a Saint Augustine, remember him? Anyhow, he was quite a sinner, quite a rounder for many years. But Augustine was honest in his sins. He tells us in his confessions that he used to sin just because it was sin. If it wasn't sinful, he wasn't interested. And in his prayers, he gives evidence of his honesty because one of his prayers was, Oh God, Grant me the grace of purity, but not yet. <laughs> and then one evening, as Augustine was walking up and down in his garden, he heard the voice as of a young girl say, Take and read, take and read. Glancing down he saw the scriptures. He picked it up and his eyes fell first upon that famous passage, quote, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, but make not provision for the flesh in its concupiscences, unquote. And then Augustine, because once again, grace and honesty met head on, made up his mind, to serve God instead of the flesh. And Augustine became one of the greatest theologians of all times because Augustine was honest. Honesty is the best policy. Then let's take a few examples now of dishonesty and see how that is intertwined with the terrible failures of history. First, there was Judas. Now, Judas was an apostle. Judas had been chosen, 
But Judas died a suicide. Why? Because Judas was dishonest. Now notice this. When the woman came in and broke the priceless ointment on the feet of Christ, what did Judas say? He said, hey, wait a minute. Don't, don't waste all that stuff. We can take that out and sell it and use the money to give it to the poor. Big liar. He wasn't interested in the poor. He was treasurer of the apostles. And again, when he betrayed Christ, he betrayed him with a kiss of friendship. One of the worst extremes of dishonesty. And what happened? Dishonesty and grace met head on. And then there was self-pity, despair, suicide. Judas was dishonest. Then we have the dramatic examples of honesty and dishonesty side by side in the two thieves. And we hear the one cursing and blaspheming and telling the Lord, if you be God, get yourself down from the cross, save yourself. He wasn't interested in saving Christ. He was only interested in his own hide. And the other thief chided him. And he said, hey, don't carry on like that. We are being justly punished for what we have done. This man has done no evil. Absolute honesty. And then he turned to Christ. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't dare ask for anything else because he knew of his own crime. But then he was enabled to hear some of the greatest words that have ever been spoken to human ears. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. That thief was honest. The other one, notice how it wraps him up. <laughs> All it says, he died blaspheming. He died blaspheming. Dishonesty. Honesty is the best policy. And so on down through history, all the truly great men were basically honest. And all your failures were basically dishonest. But we don't have to go through history. We can go to any AA group in the country and look around. Who are the ones who are sober and happy? They are the honest people. Who are the slippers and the unhappy? They are the dishonest people. You know, in the beginning of AA, to show how important is honesty, they didn't have the 12 steps. All they had were three things. First, get honest with yourself. Honesty. Second, clean house. More honesty. Third, help others. More honesty. Honesty, honesty, honesty. Honesty is the best policy. Now let's apply this in the various phases of our lives. And first, in our home life. Honesty would tell us that we should accept everyone in the home as they are, not as we think they should be. That's honesty. If the wife yak, 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 yaks, we'll accept her as such. <laughs> Honesty would say that's what she is. If the husband clams up, let him clam up. Accept it. That's the nature of the beast. You know, so much friction, so many quarrels, so much trouble in the home is caused merely by one trying to the best of their ability and even then some to change the other. <laughs> Typical of the alcoholic. If he hit a blind alley or against a blank wall, he got up and he tried it again. And no matter how many times he was knocked down, up he tried again. Instead of trying to accept it, and go around the wall. <laughs> Honesty is the best policy. Then we hear a lot about love today. 
And we sometimes wonder why uh, Mr. and Mrs. have so much trouble when they seem to love each other so much. But we wonder, do they really love each other? Now what would honesty tell us about this? Honesty would tell me that love is giving, not demanding, giving. Now anybody can give, <laughs> that's easy. But so many think love is getting. I want, give me, that's passion. Love is giving, that's honesty. Then uh, many marital troubles pop up because there was so darn much dishonesty in the courting days. <laughs> Remember? Oh, I just love what you love. The big liar, she probably hates it. <laughs> or perhaps the fellow said, Oh, I wouldn't want her to find that out for anything. He's going to marry the girl. She will find it out. And she does. And there's trouble. You know, they have the saying that a fellow goes with a gal, he falls in love with her, and he thinks so much of her that he feels he could eat her up. And then he marries her and wishes he had. <laughs> if the girl and the boy in courting days would be absolutely honest the one with the other, I believe, in my opinion, there would be many, many more happy marriages because there would be many, many more well-adjusted marriages. Honesty is the best policy. Then in our social life, honesty would tell us that society is made up of human beings and that we are all equal, one to another, under a common father who is God. So it wouldn't make any difference then whether the other fellow was black or white, or rich or poor, or Catholic or Protestant or Jew, drunk or sober, or slipping or staying on the program. Because if I am honest, I would then accept they are all equal to me. I see somebody slip, what would the honest man say? There, but for the grace of God, go I. I see somebody that is poverty stricken, what would I say? If I am honest, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I would share what I have with those who have not. Because honesty would further tell me, that what I have has been given to me from God in order to share it with those who have not. Of course, about this time, somebody's going to step up and say, now, wait a minute, I worked for what I got. <laughs> oh, you did. And now, I don't believe that statement is quite honest. Why? Because who gave us the ability to work and the talent and placed us just in the circumstances of life in which we find ourselves, uh, wasn't that God? So I think honesty would say, let's share what we have with those who have not. Honesty is the best policy. Then in regard to business, who is the successful businessman today? The honest businessman, not the fellow who pads his account or who pads his stock or his inventory trying to kid himself. He goes bankrupt. Honesty is the best policy. Then in the area of finance, honesty would tell us that we had better keep a budget. If our memories don't serve too well, we had really better keep a budget. And then these salesmen that come to the door wouldn't get us one after another, and then we suddenly wake up and find we have so many payment plans that we can't keep up with them because we weren't honest with ourselves. Salesman comes along, he says, oh, after all, just a dollar a week for 40 years. 
<laughs> Honesty is the best policy. Then in our emotional life, Honesty would tell us that the biggest cause of emotional disturbance in life is dishonesty either in thinking or living. Remember what we said? We lied to get out of the lie we told, to get out of the lie we told, to get out of the lie we told. And what keeps us awake at night so many times? Trying to shoot angles, trying to get around facts, trying to refuse still to be honest. Ask any psychiatrist, and they will tell you that at the base of all emotional disturbance, many times is caused by the attempt on the part of the person to flee reality, which is merely another way of saying to be dishonest with himself. Another type of emotional disturbance that many have and that is not necessary is trying to please everybody. Honesty would tell me I can't please everybody. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, someone's not going to like it. So what do I do? I just do the best I can do. And then if I displease some people, that's not my responsibility. That's up to Almighty God. But being human, and everyone else in this world being human, no matter what we do, who we are, someone is not going to like it. Now, if we start out with that conviction, we're not going to disturb when we hear criticism, when somebody says something or does something about us. Honesty is the best policy. Then in the mental hygiene, Honesty would tell us that this so-called acceleration of mind. Did you ever hear that term? Well, maybe you didn't, but I know you've experienced it. You know what I mean? The mind starts from... That comes from conniving. <laughs> Trying to keep one step ahead of the truth. Shooting angles again. Intelligence was given to us by Almighty God for one reason, and that is to seek truth. And the honest man is the one who seeks truth, and having found truth, he makes his decision, and action follows immediately. The dishonest fellow? Oh, he will seek truth. Yeah. And he'll find it. Uh-huh. Then he'll start shooting angles, try to get around what did we say a while ago? The fellow who is, knows two and two is four, but he can't stand it. Honesty is the best policy. Even in our physical life, honesty would tell us that many troubles are pursuant upon habits of dishonesty. Take, for example, the sudden heart attack. How many times that comes because we weren't honest with ourselves to recognize the symptoms or else we weren't honest with our doctors. Any doctor will tell you that many people go to a dozen doctors until they find one to agree with them. They're not looking to find out what's wrong with them. They're looking for someone to pat them on the back, say everything's perfectly okay. And then the sudden breakdown or the sudden heart attack because of dishonest, self-deception. Then we are told in our physical makeup that we should grow old gracefully. <laughs> you know what that means? That simply means grow old honestly. Accepting age when it comes along. When our hair turns gray, let it turn gray. When the aches and pains begin, accept them. When certain signs of age tell us to slow down, slow down. When the doctor tells us to slow down, slow down. That is growing old gracefully. Growing old honestly. In other words, a union of conviction and acceptance. That is honesty. 
Honesty is the best policy. Then in our spiritual life, honesty would tell us that it, honesty is truth. And truth is humility. And humility is sanctity. It's as simple as all that. The saints are people who have achieved 100% honesty or have become 100% humble. You know the reason that we have so many faults yet? Because we're so confounded, proud, and dishonest with ourselves. We're trying to make ourselves something that we are not. And you want to know when you're going to get rid of your faults? Huh? On the day that you become 100% honest heart humble. That will rid you of everything else and there will be plenty of room for the grace of God. Ours is only the footwork. But we do have to do the footwork. Honesty would tell us that. Honesty would tell us when you pray for potatoes, reach for a hole. <laughs> God is very good to us. He gives us without limit, but He wants us to do the footwork. And He tells us, let me take care of the consequences. Isn't that a simple way of living? In fact, that's the way the whole AA program tells us. Do what we can do each day, and God will take care of the consequences. So in our AA life, honesty tells us, that sobriety is honesty. Those who are in AA and who are so upset that they can't seem to get any serenity, the only thing they have to do is to sit down and analyze their attitudes and their actions to see how honest they are. And I'm afraid they will find out that serenity demands honesty. And on the other hand, serenity is an inevitable sequence to be honest. If I'm honest with everybody, if I'm honest with myself, my neighbor, my family, my God, I have nothing to run away from. I have nothing to get me upset. I accept everything that comes along. I am honest. That is the basis of serenity. You know, serenity is not kicking out all the problems from life. Serenity is the acceptance of problems. So many come and say, well, now look, I've been in AA and since I have come in, I've got more problems than I was, had when I was drunk. <laughs> well, nobody denies that. There's nowhere in the program that it promised material success with sobriety. It does promise serenity. And so no matter how many problems we have, serenity can be ours if we accept them or solve them. And if we can't solve them, accept them. Even the unsolvable problem is solved by acceptance. Then the slips that we see in AA. The graduates, you know. <laughs> oh, maybe they haven't slipped yet, but they've graduated. They don't come to meetings anymore. They don't do 12-step work. In fact, it isn't long until they don't think too much about AA. And then they begin to think about, oh, by all again, though. <laughs> and then they try it again. Why? They were dishonest. I don't need the program. I don't need the meetings. I'm an old timer now. I've been sober five years. I sit back now and rest on my laurels. And after all, I, I don't have to make any more 12-step calls. That's for the new guy. All dishonest thinking, which we in AA simply label stinking thinking, you know. And as the saying goes, he's not drinking yet, but he's thinking stinking, and it won't be long till he's drinking. 
That's merely another way of saying he's dishonest. Then in the beginning, why is it that so many refuse to come to AA? Because of their dishonesty. Me go to AA? What? That's a bunch of drunks. That's not for me. You hear the same thing in church. Some people say, me go to church? That's a bunch of hypocrites. You know what I tell both of those classes of people? You might as well go. There's always room for one more. <laughs> I'm sure glad we don't have any hypocrites here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have 12 suggested steps and 12 so-called traditions. Now with some of these steps or traditions, you or I perhaps may not agree. But one thing is certain, acceptance of our own honest convictions is the most important thing in all of AA, more important than all else, because that is being honest. And after all, honesty is sobriety. Honesty is serenity. Honesty is sanctity. In fact, honesty is the best policy. May God love you all. Sixteen years ago, the present Archbishop of Indianapolis released me from all parochial duties to give my time as I see fit to the members of Alcoholics Anonymous and to the groups of AA throughout the world. During those 16 years, I have traveled almost a million miles. I've had the privilege of speaking before approximately 200,000 members of AA from coast to coast and in Canada. I have had the further privilege of speaking on more intimate terms with upward of 10,000 alcoholic men and women in the various retreats I am privileged to give throughout the country. Now, traveling that far and meeting so many alcoholics, I have met a lot of characters along the way. <laughs> we do. We find every type of character in AA. We find members of the upper crust. Mem you know what the upper crust is. <laughs> That's a bunch of crumbs held together by a little dough. <laughs> We find members of the medical profession, uh, to talking about the medical profession, they tell the story about one morning rather early, a gentleman appeared at the tavern before it was open. He was walking up and down, up and down. He was shaking all over, you know, and pretty soon the tavern keeper came along. He opened the tavern. He went behind the bar. This fellow rushed in. He put his money on the bar. He says, give me a double shot. Just then the tavern keeper looked around and he said, Oh, good morning, doctor. What are you doing these days? And the guy said, Oh, I, I'm still doing brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> we even meet those fellows in the AA whom we call psychiatrists, believe it or not. You know who they are. They are the good doctors who treat neuroses and psychosis. You know, there's a difference between the two. A person with a psychosis is out of this world. A person with a neurosis is in this world, but he's awfully jittery about it. <laughs> a person with a psychosis thinks two and two is five. A person with a neurosis knows two and two is four, but he can't stand it. <laughs> you know, they tell the story that one time a little girl, nine years old, was taken to the psychiatrist. And this doctor to whom she went was a very 
elderly paternal type individual. So he patted the little girl on the head and he says, now tell me little girl, is it true what they say about you that you hate your daddy? She said, yes, I hate my daddy. Well, the doctor said, how about your mommy? Do you hate her? She said, yes, I hate her. Wish she was dead. Well, the psychiatrist said, how about your little brothers and sisters? Do you hate them? She said, yes, I hate them. I'm going to kill them. Well, the doctor said, and just then he drew up and stroked his chin, looked down, and just then the little girl looked up. She said, some psychosis, eh, doc? <laughs> We find, too, that one of the things an alcoholic cannot do is tolerate resentments. And we find that resentment usually begins in anger, in getting mad, to use the simple term. And speaking of getting angry, they tell the story of the fellow who was on the 20th Century Limited one time. You know, that's the train that goes between New York City and return. So he was on his way to New York City, and he called a porter to his... Uh, quarters, and he said, look, Porter, I've got to get off this train in Buffalo, New York in the morning. Now, the train got in Buffalo at 5 o'clock in the morning. So he told the porter, now, don't let anything stop you from putting me off the train at 5 o'clock. I've got one of the most important appointments of my life to keep there. Yeah, sir, the fellow said. So the train went on through the night, and finally the next morning late, the train pulled into the Grand Central Station. And uh, as the porter stepped off the back platform, whom should he see come running out of the train but this fellow? The fellow grabbed the porter by the nap of the neck. He said, Porter, why didn't you awaken me and put me off the train at Buffalo? He said, uh, you caused me to miss the most important appointment of my life. And he swore and he cursed and finally turned on his heel and ran out of the station. Well, just then the station master came along. And he looked at the porter and he said, Porter, did you ever see anybody so mad in all your life? Yeah, sir, the porter said. You should have seen the guy I put off at Buffalo. <laughs> we also have those fellows and gals come to AA whom we call uh, the no God guys and gals. They are the ones who will not or cannot seem to get the idea of a God. In one of the groups that happened one time and some of the other members of the group were trying to convince this individual that there was a God. But they got nowhere. So finally one evening after the meeting one of these fellows said, now look, do you mean to tell me that there never has been a time in your whole life when you just out of sheer desperation didn't ask God to help you? No, sir. Yes, sir, he said, there was one time. Come to think of it, there was one time. Some years ago, I was on a hunting trip up in Canada. And during the hunting trip, a snowstorm came up. It got colder and colder. It snowed harder and harder. It became a veritable blizzard. And then I got lost from my companions. And then it was, as darkness approached, I asked God to help me. Well, the guy smiled and looked at him. He said, well, he got you out of it, didn't he? No, sir, the fellow said. If an Indian guide hadn't come along, I'd have froze to death. <laughs> Then traveling so far, I have come through practically all sections of these United States. And uh, up in the town of Albuquerque, they have an Indian with a phenomenal memory. Uh, supposedly, you can ask this Indian anything about his past, and he can immediately tell you. So one time, a visitor came to Albuquerque, and a friend of his took him down to see this Indian. So he asked the Indian, what did you have for breakfast five years ago? And the Indian immediately says, eggs. Well, on the way home, this visitor said to his friend, look, he said, that guy's a fake. Oh, he's a phony. He said, everybody has eggs for breakfast. I don't believe him. Well, now it so happened that this visitor came back to Albuquerque seven years later. And as he got off the train, 
Whom should he see standing there on the platform but this Indian? And the thought immediately struck him, there's that phony. Watch me needle him. So he drew himself up, raised his hand, said, how? The Indian said, scramble. <laughs> There's one type of alcoholic we never meet, and that is a dumb alcoholic. <laughs> Uneducated, but not dumb. You know, speaking of dumbness, there were three young ladies at the movies one afternoon. And while they were there during the newsreel, the picture of the Pope was flashed on the screen. Well, just then, one of these young ladies made a very disparaging remark about the Pope. Immediately, another of the young ladies got up and walked out. Well, the one who made the remark turned to the one who remains and Mary, why did Helen leave? Well, she said, after all, you know, uh, the remark you made about the Pope and you know Helen's a Catholic, didn't you know that? Oh, yes, she said, I knew she was a Catholic, but I didn't know he was. <laughs> Then we find in AA2 one of the qualities of the average alcoholic, not only that the alcoholic is that way because it's the quality of human nature, but one of the qualities we always find in all the groups, there's some who love to brag, at least a few. Well, anyhow, in one of the groups one time, there was one of these characters who bragged that he knew all the important people of the world personally. Another member of the group got rather tired of listening to this bragging. So one day he called him aside. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that I can name three important people in public life. And I'll bet you don't know at least one of them. Why? He said, that's easy. You name them and I'll show you I know them. Well, he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. If you know all three, I'll pay all the expenses and I'll give you a thousand dollars. The other fellow said, fine. The other fellow's name was John Doak. So anyhow, uh, the fellow asked him, now who are the three that uh, you will uh, claim that you want me to know? So this fellow named off President Kennedy, Prime Minister McMillan, and the Pope. Why? He said, I know them all personally. Okay, so let's go prove it. So they took a plane to Washington. And as they approached the White House lawn, this fellow saw the guard. He went over to the guard and started talking to him for a few moments. Finally, the guard went inside, and who came out but Jack and Jackie? Well, hello, hello, hello. If it isn't John Doe, come in, come in, come in. All the other guys said, he sure knows the president and his wife. I have to hand it to him. I bet he don't know Macmillan. So they got a plane to London. Went to 10 Downing Street, same thing happened. The fellow went over and talked to the guard. Finally, the guard went inside, came back out, and uh, who came out behind him? His arms outstretched, but... Prime Minister McMillan said, well, 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 if it isn't John Doak from the United States, come in, come in, come in. Well, the fellow thought, by golly, he sure knows the Prime Minister. Bet he don't know the Pope. He said, come on, let's go to Rome. So they got a plane to Rome, and as they approached the uh, Basilica of St. Peter's and were standing there in the piazza in the front of St. Peter's, the guy said to the other fellow, John Doak said, look, now I'll go inside and I'll get the Pope, and then I'll come out on the balcony arm in arm with him. Will that prove that I know him? Well, he said, sure, no one but a personal friend could do that. Okay, he says, you wait here. So John went inside, and pretty soon on the balcony appeared this majestic figure all dressed in white, you know, and on his arm, John Doe. Just then a thought struck the fellow. He thought, by golly, I bet he's got somebody dressed as the Pope. So he looked around, he saw a little urchin there on the side. And he said, say, buddy, by the way, is that the Pope up there on the balcony? The little guy looked up, he says, I I'm not quite sure, sir, but if it isn't John Doak from the United States. A few months ago, I was in Detroit, Michigan. You know, they have these uh, sightseeing buses up there, these double-deckers. 
And so one day one of these buses was going around to the various places of interest and as the bus would stop, the guide would explain what the certain place was. So they stopped in front of a huge estate and the driver said, now there on the right is the Dodge estate. Just then a little lady in the middle of the bus jumped up and she said, you mean Horace Dodge, mister? No, lady, the driver said, John Dodge. Well, the bus went along a little bit further, finally came to another huge estate. And the driver said, now there on the left is the Ford estate. Same little lady jumped up. She said, you mean Henry Ford, mister? No, lady, the driver said, Edsel Ford. Well, the bus went on a little bit further, and finally it came to a huge building on the corner. And the driver said, now there is the Christ Cathedral. Absolute silence. Finally, a big bass voice in the back of the bus boomed out and said, Go on, lady, ask him. You can't be wrong all the time. <laughs> I was also through the state of Missouri en route on this trip. You know, that's the state that Harry Truman comes from. <laughs> I think most of you know who Harry Truman is. But anyhow, uh, they tell the story that one time Eleanor Roosevelt was visiting the Trumans. And when she arrived, Harry was out in back of the house in his garden. So Eleanor and Bess were talking a while, and finally Harry came in and said, Oh, hello, Eleanor, how are you? Glad to see you. He said, you know, I've been out in my garden this afternoon. He said, you know, I have a very nice little garden the back of my house. And today I've been out there spreading manure all over the garden for the fall weather. Well, they talked a while, and finally uh, Harry bid adieu, went back to his garden. And then it was that Eleanor turned to Bess, and she said, Bess, you should train him better than that. You should train him to say fertilizer." Bess says, my goodness, it's taken me 30 years to get him to say manure. I've only found one state in the whole United States that has no alcoholics. That's the state of South Carolina. They have alkeholics. <laughs> they also tell the story of another psychiatrist that had three ladies to come to see him one time with their children. And when the women arrived at the doctor's office, the first one went inside in the inner office to see him. Now, it so happened that the partition between the inner office and the outer office was so thin that those in the outer office could overhear everything that was going on in the inner office. So this first woman who had gone in was telling the doctor what a terrible little girl her daughter was, the awful things that she had done the terrible circumstances she got messed up in. Well, the doctor let her talk a while and finally said, now look, lady, just a moment. It isn't your daughter who is at fault, it's you. He said, you have a compulsion for money. He said, that's the reason you call her Penny. Well, she finally left and the next lady went in. The same type of conversation went on. The woman told the doctor what a terrible little girl her daughter was, the awful things she had done. And finally the doctor let her talk and then said, look, lady, it's not your daughter who is at fault, it's you. He said, you have a terrible compulsion for sweets. He said, that's the reason you call her sugar. Just then they heard a commotion in the outer office and someone said, come on, Shenley, let's get the heck out of here. <laughs> In all my experience in AA, 
There's one thing I have noticed on many walls of the meeting halls and of the club rooms and the various places where AA assembles, and that is the expression, don't take yourself so damn seriously. Now that means an awful lot, because the one thing we have lost over the years is our sense of humor. I don't think anyone here who belongs to Alcoholics Anonymous or if even any wife of an alcoholic who now belongs to Alcoholics Anonymous could see anything humorous about the time we were sobering up that last time. But the reason is because unless a human being enables himself to achieve a sense of humor where he can laugh, both at himself and other. Not only the road of sobriety, but the road of life becomes very, very difficult. In fact, the Recovery Incorporated. Now, for those who do not know, the Recovery Incorporated is an organization of people who meet in order to solve specific neurotic problems. They have a very similar saying. Don't make a federal case out of everything. And so it is with those two ideas I would like to leave you. Don't take ourselves so seriously. No matter what happens today, what has happened yesterday, what will happen tomorrow, we aren't the first ones to whom it has happened. We are only one little speck in the human race. Among millions and millions and millions and millions of people down back through the ages and in the ages of those unborn. We're such a small fry when we really analyze it. And I think that's the most humorous part of life is to think how often we think ourselves so big, so important, and then suddenly realize someday that we don't mean much at all. You know, there's a lot of people in life, they go on through life trying to find somebody who thinks as much of them as their mother did. (laughs) You're not going to find that kind of person. (laughs) Because to every other human being, to the average person, we are not important. In the same expression, not make a federal case out of everything. We have emotional disturbances, laugh at them, let them go. Think of some of the humor that we have spoken about for the last 15 or 20 minutes, and perhaps it would help us to realize that we too could fit in with the laughter instead of the tears, because there's no truer saying that was ever made than The one that says, when you laugh, the world laughs with you. But when you weep, you weep alone. And you know and I know that the very depths of self-pity simply is pinpointing me as someone who is weeping alone over me. Why this big world of ours goes by, not caring, not looking. You know, there's nothing more dead than yesterday's headlines. And no matter how great a thing you do today, tomorrow, that's going to be yesterday. And the only thing that's important to you is today, 24 hours at a time. So it's not only a question of making it worthwhile, but with a light heart, with a smile, with laughter. God doesn't like long pusses. You know, so many people think that a guy walking down the street with a sour puss and a long face and a rosary in one hand and a prayer book in the other, they think he's a saint. He's not a saint. He's cracked. (laughs) No one was quicker to tell a good humorous story than the saints. 
and particularly were they not only able to, but very adept at laughing at themselves. Now, of course, the saints didn't go around telling dirty stories. (laughs) You know, I always kind of wonder why when a person gets up before a large audience in a public meeting and starts telling what I call dirty stories. I don't know, I I believe he just has lost his real sense of humor because I don't believe the average person uh, goes along with him in liking such stories publicly. I know one fellow got up and uh, he thought he was at a stag meeting. Oh, you've heard about that too. So uh, he looked around, he said... Just a minute, I, I was just looking around to see if there's any ladies in the house. Just then a fellow got up in the back. He said, just a minute, sir. He said, there's no ladies present, but they're sure in the devil are gentlemen. So let's clean it up. So that's just a little about stories, about humor, about laughter. You know, there's in laughter one of the best tonics in all the world. I remember reading one time, I forget who was the author, that Christ never smiled. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that Christ never smiled. I think one of the glories of eternity is going to be when we see that divine smile. Because the sense of humor is behind the entire human race. To think that a God could take you and me and all the millions of human beings and create them for his honor and glory. He had to have a sense of humor. You know, that should sink in very, very deeply. (laughs) Even in that morning period when we get up (laughs) and take that first look in the mirror, Lord pity the fellow or the gal who doesn't have a sense of humor. And all the faults and the failings and all the stupid things we think and do as the day goes by, God pity the man or the woman who doesn't have a sense of humor. And as the night falls, we take a few moments to ourselves to take an inventory. And there again see nothing but a repetition of ridiculous thinking and stupid actions, Lord pity the man or the woman who doesn't have a sense of humor. Because you know that's the most difficult job you're going to have in life. And that's the realization that even though you live another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you're still going to have to accept all those faults and failings to a great degree. That's the most difficult job of adjustment to reality. And believe me, the greatest aid next to the grace of God to adjust with reality in life. And adjustment to reality gives happiness because adjustment to reality gives the adjustment of will to the divine will. That eliminates friction. That eliminates dissatisfaction. That engenders and promotes happiness, peace of mind, and serenity. And the greatest factor therein involved, next to the grace of God, is a sense of you. And if I have helped any of you to smile, then I'm grateful to God. And if I have caused anyone to shed a tear anywhere in this world, 
I don't think there's a greater thing that I have to regret. So let's all have one big laugh. Okay? Let's have a laugh. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.